Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Sarah Montague. It was front page news around the world when a mass grave was discovered at a mother and baby home in Ireland. The remains of almost 800 babies were found. But research by Paul Redmond, my guest today, showed that was only the tip of the iceberg. He collected evidence of high death rates at homes for illegitimate children across Ireland. And he also claimed the Catholic nuns who ran them were trading in adoptions, being paid to send children to the United States for adoption, often against the mother's wishes and sometimes without her knowledge. He was born in one of those homes and adopted before he was a month old. Now he feels he has a duty to expose what went on. Redmond, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. You refer to a life-changing moment in your book, The Adoption Machine, uh, when you went back to the home in which you were born in 2011 with a group of other people from there who had been adopted, mm -hmm. um, and you visited something that's called the Angel's Plot. Can you yeah. tell us about it? Yeah. The Angel's Plots are the... Um, common term we use to describe uh, the baby graves in the mother that are attached to the mother and baby homes not all of them had the plots attached so sometimes they use public cemeteries to bury the babies but in the case of where i was born in castle pollard uh, and we've discovered since that there are 200 babies buried there along with at least another 100 stillborn babies um, but I, i'd never visited the place before and this is only going back to 2011 and uh, I or helped organise a, a visit and we decided to plant a tree in the Angel's Plot in memory of the babies. Uh, well, we consider them our crib mates as we refer to them. And uh, it ended up with me digging a hole for a, quite a large tree in the middle of the Angel's Plot. And it was a life-changing moment for me. I, I can't, I've never been able to fully explain it. Um, although I tried for months afterwards, I wrote poems, wrote plays, um, tried to figure it out in my own head. And I've never fully understood it, but I somehow developed a bond with, with, with uh, my fallen crib mates, really. And I, I often say, uh, the, the one thing I would say to define it is that I walked into the plot uh, as an adoptee, but I walked out as a survivor, hell-bent determined to do something. Hadn't a clue what I was going to do or how to do it. Had no experience in the field, but I just knew I had to do something. Because your experience in that home, which is where you were born in 1964, was... Well, it was obviously very different from those in the Angel's plot in that you survived, but it was also, it was not a bad experience, was it? Well, I, I don't personally remember it, but Castle Pollard was unusual in terms of the mother and baby homes in that it was a strange mixture of public and private. Uh, because the head of the Sacred Heart Order at the time when that home was built uh, was actually a local woman from County Westmead. And she didn't want a, a, a notorious hellhole in her own backyard, so to speak. Um, so it was the jewel in the crown of the Sacred Heart Empire. They, they owned the second, third and fourth biggest of the, mother and of the nine mother and baby homes. Okay, so for, for what you have since worked out is that your mother went in there for a month and you were successfully adopted and have had... And, I mean, you love your adoptive mm. parents. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, it, adoption does damage, but good parents uh, and a lot of love can heal a lot of that damage. And certainly I was incredibly lucky to go to wonderful parents. My dad passed away about three years ago. My mum is still alive and I, I still love her to bits and I still miss my dad every day. OK, you write in, in, this, in your book about how you had this fantasy about what it was like, the mm. sort of an old Georgian house, your young mother mm. in a chair with colourful throws, yeah. the sun streaming through the window and yeah. nuns fluttering around yeah and taking care of her yeah that was the image i had growing up in my head that's uh, all adoptees kind of develop some fantasy of their own background and that was mine uh, it turned out to be complete rubbish of course uh, what do you know about it 
about the institution itself yeah. a huge amount. There's probably no more known about Castle Pollard than any of the other mother and baby homes. Um, so what would the real has seen have been? The real scene was that it was a 75 bed um, maternity hospital with 125 cots. Uh, it was a grey, grim, custom built institution. Uh, standards were, in, in effect, it was a cross between a maternity hospital for single mothers and a low to medium security prison. Uh, the wards where the babies were kept were locked at night, the dormitories where the mothers were kept were locked at night. And there was one midwife at a time working in the place, there was no doctors or nurses. Food was absolutely grim. Uh, it was a working farm. The girls were expected to, to work on the farm for, uh, generally speaking, about two years to supposedly repay the debt they owed the nuns for taking care of them, despite the fact the government was paying for their care. Because these are women who would have been taken there by their own families. Mm. I, I would kind of have issues with, with, with that particular phrase now. Uh, Ireland was, a, a, in all, to all effective purposes, a theocracy for a lot of this time, and the church ruled the roost. And families didn't really have much choice. Now, there was elements there of, yes, they did, they did bring their daughters there, but it was because most of them had little or no choice in the matter. What? So you're... So they would what go to the priest? They were the, the local parish priest. As a general rule, was the entry point into the system for most people. All the parish priests in Ireland would have had the phone numbers or the addresses of of a mother and baby home they used. And when any mother or father came to them, going, "My daughter's in trouble," well, this is what's going to happen, and okay. there was no discussion about it. So, in the places like Castle Pollard, there would have been single mothers who would have their babies there. Yes. And, they, and the child would stay for? The child could stay, in my case, because it was a private patient, I was there for 13 days. Um, but at an ex most children semi-grew up there to the point of two or three years of age. Uh, I know of at least one case where a child was in a mother and baby home till they were just short of six years of age. Uh, but we, we were all then adopted out. But... Um, the, the, the children and mothers were separated throughout the day. Um, the, the mothers went off to work, children were left in large wards and grossly neglected. Um, one mother would be put in charge of them and she, as a general rule she just couldn't cope with the amount of babies in a particular ward. It could be anything from 12 to 20 babies at a time. To take you back to that moment that you say changed your life in the Angel's Plot, mm. you, you write that you were determined to do something, yes. that you became an activist by default. Mm. I wanted to ram hard facts and figures down Ireland's throat. Yes. And I still do. What facts? What figures? Uh, the, the, basically, I, I wrote a report. What I discovered basically was that after that experience in the Angels Plot, that there was nothing known about the system or the homes, either individually or collectively. There was no books about them, there was no reports about them. The activist community, which had existed for over 20 years at that stage, had been obsessively focused on opening the adoption records and had missed the big picture that sealed adoption records are really part, a small part of a massive network and system that existed to punish single women viciously. And I, I wanted every fact and figure I could, I could find about that. Uh, and particularly about mortality rates in the homes. And what has been discovered since uh, has been absolutely shocking um, and has shocked people to their core. Uh, to give a good example, in, in 1944, in Bespera, the Chief Medical Officer of Ireland pulled a surprise visit on them. He was a very decent man called James Deeney. And he writes in his autobiography, The Care at the Cure, that the previous year, 180 babies had been born there and considerably more than 100 had died. Now, it's actually transpired since that it was 121 died. That's a mortality rate of 68%. Uh, the following year after his intervention, it went up to 82%. Okay. Now, that is in one year. More typically, you looked, and you looked at the figures, you give mm -hmm. them for the 20s, when they were in, in across the homes, roughly about 30%, which was, so four or five times the national the mortality rate. The national Easily, mortality rate. Yeah and spiking up to 50% regularly. St. Patrick's on the Navin Road, the, f the first and oldest, the biggest of the homes, that hit 50% in the 20s. Shanross Abbey hit 50% twice in, in the 30s. Uh, right what across was going the on? Why do you think the mortality rates were so high? Neglect, straightforward uh, neglect. 
the nuns just simply didn't care if we lived or died back in those days. Uh, we were nothing. Illegitimate were considered defective, stained, tainted children. Um, and it, there was a common belief in society, particularly in Ireland at the time, that if you were illegitimate, um, that somehow you had some sort of, not just a moral weakness, but a physical weakness, and that you would die easily. So it, it, in Ireland, there was no surprise, really, that babies were dying at these sort of rates. People just shrugged their shoulders. Now, you're putting the, you're putting the blame on the Catholic Church, mm. but, but there was a Church of Ireland, a Protestant home, Bethany, and yeah. that similarly had very high rates. It did, uh, in Ireland. And it seems to have aped the, the Catholic homes in Ireland, which which is kind of bizarre. But, but it, it would suggest it was a problem of society rather than the church. Well, I, I can't really speak for exactly what was going on in, in the Protestant Bethany home, um, and but a great deal of research has been done into that home by Derek Bethany, or Derek Leinster and the Bethany group. Uh, it is comparable to what happened in the Catholic homes, but it seems to have been unique to Ireland. Even with these, these um, infant mortality rates, yeah. you're talking about going back to the 20s. Yes. I mean, with, that was a time when there weren't antibiotics, when there weren't vaccinations. And when those come in, the, the mortality rate drops dramatically? Well, yes and no. The mortality rate dropped dramatically in Ireland uh, uh, in the late, from the late 40s onwards, but that coincided with the start of the Banished Babies trade, which was a huge money spinner for the nuns. But if I, if I could just actually... So, but, let, and let, yeah. I want to pick you up on that, okay. because this is a central claim of your book, mm. and it is, I mean, it is a very stark criticism. You suggest that the reason that the death rates go down is because the nuns, the Catholic Church, saw these babies, realised they could make money out of them. Yes, that is a fact. And well, where's the evidence? The, the, the evidence is the fact that the mortality rates plummeted after the Banish Babies trade started. And it, it is literally, you can see the correlation between them. From the time the Banished Babies Trade started in '45, that is when the mortality rate started to fall. But it also coincides with a time when rationing is ended, mm. when the there is vaccinations begin, and when antibiotics come in. There's no question that whatever way you dress it up, um, and you can look into all these facts, figures and aspects of it. But the fact of the matter is, there is no excuse for children dying at the rate of four out of every five babies dying in Bespera in 1945. That is not that isn't to do with lack of antibiotics, that is to do with lack of care. It is a point that is, that's made by David Quinn, who writes in The Irish Catholic, yeah. uh, that, and he puts it down to the fact that you don't even mention this idea of vaccinations and antibiotics coming on stream. Yeah. And, and cutting infant mortality across society. I'm sorry, but David Quinn is head of the Ioni Institute which is a, a basically a very conservative Catholic group in Ireland. He has a motivation for saying that. He has presented but, absolutely but, but you no do evidence accept, whatsoever. But you do accept that that cut infant mortality rate across society would have had an impact in these homes? I, I don't believe so because that it, there wasn't the same impact in general society in Ireland. There's no dramatic fall in the infant mortality rates across the country in Ireland over those years. Dr Lindsay Anna Byrne, who's a lecturer in history at University College yes. Dublin, said that this, and has written about uh, this this time period and what was happening, says that Toome, which is the home where 800 babies were found in a mass grave, didn't happen in a vacuum. And she said, and she makes the point, that every year in the 30s and 40s, the number of deaths of illegitimate children was published. It was known. It was in the public domain. Yes. Society knew. A society did knew, but society didn't care. And society thought they knew the reason for that was because illegitimate children were weaklings. You have to remember at the time, illegitimate people couldn't become priests in the Catholic Church. They couldn't join the, the Irish the Gardaí, which is the Irish police force. They were officially banned from becoming Gardaí. But why do you direct your ire and your fire on the Catholic Church when it's society that is just as responsible? I don't accept that society is responsible. I, I believe that the Catholic Church's influence on society was so pervasive and so corrosive that they must accept their full responsibility for it. They force people into the mother and baby homes and ultimately at the end of the day, how can you justify running a maternity hospital without doctors or nurses or medical equipment or, or pain-killing or, or pain drugs? 
You can't justify that in any way, shape or form. Nobody, and, uh, no, there and was the nobody... head of the Catholic Church mm. in England and Wales, Cardinal Vincent uh, Nichols, apologised for the hurt caused by agencies acting in the name of the Catholic Church. The he current head of the church in Ireland, Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, has said that it's something that he th believes it's important that Pope Francis addresses when he comes at to Ireland I in August. So it is recognised by the Catholic Church now. Just about, but I, I mean, the, the, uh, I, I first met Archbishop Dermot Martin in 2012 and presented him what little evidence we had at the time about the mother and baby homes. And that's only, when you talk about what happened in the Angels plot in Castle Pollard, that was only seven or eight months after that. He was presented with the facts and figures that we had at the time. He was asked to, to call for a public inquiry and he refused. He, he, he what? He... Refu he point blank refused. He said they'd only laugh at me, Paul. And he said that several times in front of a number of witnesses, including a mid-ranking guardie at the time, who was at that meeting. He simply wouldn't do anything about it. But there has been. What has happened as a result of these, um, the information that's come to light is the government is taking action. Mm. There is a commission which will be reporting in February and looking at all this. Yes. Do you accept that that is the right process? Yes and no. I mean, certainly uh, the, the inquiry was the right way forward, but it is a flawed inquiry in, in that it is not addressing the whole issue. A large uh, section of our community has been excluded from it. One of the things we are campaigning for now is full inclusion in the inquiry, because unless you were actually born in a mother and baby home, you're not included in the inquiry. There is, though, a scoping um, inquiry into the scale of illegal adoptions. Mm. Now, there are some claims that you have made. You've made claims that these, these were forced adoptions. What evidence do you have? The evidence of, I, I, I know a great deal of survivors, including natural mothers and adoptees, and I'm talking about knowing hundreds of people, and I have listened to the testimonies and the, and the sad stories over and over again over the years, and there's no doubt in my mind people were forced into this. Um, th th this peaked in 1967 in Ireland when over 97% of all illegitimate children were adopted, and that is a phenomenal figure. Was it happening against their wishes, as in they were saying, I do not want this to happen, or were they just going along with the this, this society, the way that society happened to be at the time? Uh, as a general rule, you could say they were going along with it because they just felt they had no choice. There was no single mother's allowance, there was no representative group. So it wasn't forced in that sense? It was forced in the sense that the Catholic Church... Um, were pervasive in Ireland and were in control of, of, of the government in terms of social legislation and social attitudes from the government. So it was down to social attitudes that this was happening, because that's very different. If you talk about forced adoptions, mm. people will have in their head the idea of a baby being wrenched from somebody. I mean, we're not talking about that. We are. We are. I literally know women who, whose babies were taken out of their arms, crying and begging for their babies to be given back. I know women who went back to mother and baby homes and adoption agencies looking for their babies back and they were told their babies had died, they were adopted, they'd gone to America. The whole nine yards, it was forced adoption. The, the point I would make is that the church was a very formidable organisation in Ireland which vetted all social legislation in advance, which essentially co-wrote the Irish Constitution. We have a situation where I know as well that you'd like to change, unlike the UK, where adoption records are sealed. Mm. And when you came to look for your mother, yes. as you started to do at the age of 15, mm. but it took years and years before you located her, didn't it? It took 33 years until I was 48 to have a single phone call with her, about 40 minutes long, and there won't be any more, and that's it. Um, when I, after, uh, when I was 13 days old uh, in Castle Pollard, my mother and I were transferred to St. Patrick's Mother and Baby Home, the Navin Road, and I was taken out of her arms in the hall by Sister Agnes and sent to the wards. They had notorious huge wards in the place. She was told to go outside and sit on the wall and wait for her father to collect her. Um, we had an office in town. He got a call, told, and I've never seen her since that day, and I never will. But you had this conversation with her. Why do you say there won't be another one? Because she made it clear she didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I kind of knew that anyway because social services had contacted her several times 
over the years, or at least tried to. She was avoiding them, um, and she uh, she she was never in any way, shape, or form proactive or open to contact over the years. But I still felt I needed to know some of my natural family, and some of them did want to know me when I contacted them and were very happy to meet me. But um, she did not want. To, she was talked into taking that phone call by her brother. Why do you think she didn't want to talk to you? She was too traumatised by it. Um, I did learn during that phone call that she has a complete memory blackout from the time, a form of selective amnesia from the time I was born until I was 13 years old. She is convinced that, she, that the nuns put her on a train the same day I was born and sent her to Dublin. And she says, my father collected me outside of a place like the one I'd been in. Uh, but I know that, in actual fact, we were we were driven to Dublin by the local taxi driver uh, with a nun in the car, one of the Sacred Hearts. You, uh, you talk about the decades mm. which you've spent searching for her, you've written yeah. about it. That it ended that way, that must have been a huge disappointment and not what you expected. Yes and no. It wasn't a disappointed appointment. I, I, I take the positive out of it. Um, I know so many adoptees who've never, ever had as much as the name of their mothers. I, I know adoptees who've never had a birth certificate. I know adoptees who've been reunited with headstones in lonely graveyards. Um, so I take the positive out of it. At least I had a conversation. At least I've seen her picture. So I can't be too upset about that um, compared to, to other people. And the important point I do make there as well is that it has given me something permanent, solid to fix onto and deal with and have closure as much as I possibly can. You other end, people never get that. You end your description by saying an ugly truth is better than a beautiful lie. And it is. Many people will listen to this and think, the last home closed in 1996. Mm -hmm. We're talking about events and mortality rates which were an awful long time ago. Mm -hmm. What value is there in raking over all this now? The truth. There's always value in the truth. Um, and the fact of the matter is that it may have happened a long time ago, but in the Castle Pollard group, which I found in Run, our oldest member's daughter is in the group, and she was born there in 1935 in the year it opened. This, this is not ancient history. Um, there are tens of thousands of survivors of this system still left alive in Ireland and still suffering. And a, a proper inquiry, a proper apology, and um, a redress scheme, a compensation scheme at the end of that, hopefully, will give a lot of closure to those people. You don't feel that you've had a proper apology? We've never had an apology of any description from church or state. Never. In Ireland? Never. Because one of the things to understand about Ireland is that if somebody apologises, it's almost an admission of legal liability in Ireland. And they, the church has never apologised, and the state has never apologised. But society has changed. The church is not as, as allied, as close to the state as it was. No, absolutely not, because the church dug its heels in and resisted social change as much as possible. And, and was still a very, very powerful, and is still a very powerful force in Ireland, but was, but was in a way, a very, in a way their power was only broken in the early 90s. And that, again, that's not ancient history by any stretch of the imagination. And do you think that this is one of the reasons that the church has lost its grip on the state? It's one of them. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the, the church was... Uh, um, drenched uh, and drowned in scandal after scandal. First there was the, the, the child sex abuse scandals by the clergy, then there was the cover up by the, by the hierarchy in Ireland, then there was the industrial schools, the reformatory schools. It's just been a shopping list of horror and abuse uh, the whole way through the 90s and that's what actually broke the Catholic Church in Ireland and again, that's not ancient history. That's only 20 years ago. Paul Redmond, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Thank you.